Oh Welcome God, everyone amazing. back. My name is Jamie Woodson and I have the privilege of co-chairing with uh, Tony Marks and being a citizen volunteer with all the other commissioners around the table uh, to explore what I think is a, a very important endeavor uh, in our democracy in America. And so um, one of the things that bit. I'm cognizant of from weird. last night and even from the conversation earlier this morning is all of this is set in a context of a rapidly changing environment and evolving environment uh, where trust is devolving uh, rapidly as well and has now for multiple decades in institutions in this American democracy. And so I think that this conversation and the endeavor that we're on as a commission is incredibly important and again want to, as Tony did, thank uh, the Aspen Institute and the Knight Foundation for challenging us to have a a conversation. Um, I, I left the first panel uh, with uh, more questions than answers, which is okay. Uh, I think many of us uh, have a lot of follow-up to do to understand more deeply what the implications might be uh, from some of what we have heard and understood, and that's why we're trying to make this as public and transparent a process as we can, but we'll have follow-ups for that conversation as well, and so uh, as we are in a learning process now and not necessarily a quick uh, knee-jerk to solutions, um, we did have some interesting things that came from earlier. What are the implications of potential regulatory policy if we're wanting to increase trust in media and democracy? What uh, is the role of the evolution of technology and taking advantage of that? Uh, what is the role or what is the potential for transparencies and increasing transparencies uh, in when I hear my fellow commissioners say we want to have impactful solutions, uh, perhaps bold, but certainly impactful solutions and not simply an exercise um, that will, will be without meaning, um, those are going to have to be explored. And so I'm particularly excited about this panel and, and the conversation. Um, as, as I think about the new literacies, whether it's media literacy, news, uh, digital uh, information, uh, civic, uh, when I think about those kinds of literacies, I do imagine them as opportunities for us to be solvers and how might we utilize these literacies to combat against false information and to empower citizens across our country and our world um, to really parse through this complex environment that, that is changing moment to moment. And so, I think we've got a, a panel of leaders who can help us explore those questions um, about how these may uh, help us fight uh, against that kind of information and or at least be a tool to move the needle in a meaningful way as we, we desire to um, explore this issue of trust and building trust. And so with that, I'd love to introduce um, our panelists um, who are here with us. Um, first, uh, I'll go in alphabetical order just because that seems to be the thing. Did you, I don't know if you noticed this. Your folks were er, your, your lower alphabet folks. These folks kind of cover the end of the alphabet, and they're all in order. It's fascinating. I was, I was like, well, wasn't that just clever? Uh, so we're really thrilled everybody's here. Jenny, uh, very thrilled that you're with us today. Jenny Lee, former New York Times reporter, creator of Miss InfoCon, uh, fellow at Brown, and, and so much more, honestly, and not just because I love the emoji, the dumpling emoji, and I appreciate that that's in your bio, by the way. Uh, but they do have extensive bios in, in our book, so feel free to, to learn more. Um, welcome. We're thrilled that you're with us. Uh, Sally Lehrman, um, and you all do have uh, information in front of you uh, at, at each of your um, desks. Uh, the founder and director of the Trust Project, uh, really uh, complex, international, collaborative, uh, working to build confidence in the news and information. What an endeavor. Um, and as we explore this as a possible solution um, and learning opportunity, we're thrilled that you're with us today. Um, also, we have Nate Pers Persley, a uh, Stanford Law professor, um, expert in constitutional matters of controversy, which fantastic area of focus for you. Um, particularly uh, interesting that he has a focus on the law of democracy uh, and all of the issues, whether they're voting rights issues, political parties, campaign finance. And so I think we're going to have a lot to learn from this conversation and what does it, what are the impacts uh, for us today. 
Uh, last but certainly not least, um, Esther Wojcicki, welcome. We appreciate your uh, time here as I think about the opportunity uh, and our own goals as lifelong learners to have a former California Teacher of the Year and the founder of the Palo Alto High School uh, Center for Media Arts. We're thrilled that you're with us today and are excited about the opportunities to learn about uh, not only the ways you've focused on empowering young people to be uh, critical discerners of information, uh, but how we might imagine this at the, the larger level. And so with that, I'm going to just begin. Welcome. We're thrilled that you're here. We'll go through the same sort of things. Quick reminders. Uh, after the break, put your cell phones on mute or silent, um, and we'll spend as much time as we can uh, giving commissioners opportunity to question uh, our guests uh, after they've had an opportunity just to frame whatever portion of the conversation uh, they'd like to, to share with us. Nate. Great, thank you. Let me thank the Knight Foundation uh, in general. You all have uh, uh, helped sponsor a program here that <laughs> F Frank Fukuyama and I are overseeing on uh, the Project on Democracy and the Internet, which is just uh, taken off uh, in the last few months, and we are trying to deal with all of these questions that you're dealing with here today. I also have a personal relationship with the Knight Foundation since I'm a native of Miami. So uh, growing up in Miami, uh, the Knight Foundation, you know, touched all of our sort of cultural, uh, uh, journalistic lives, uh, and and so I uh, thank you for uh, I was I participated in the Silver Knight competition that you all uh, run when I was a. Uh, junior high and high school students, so, so the Knight Foundation's been an important part of uh, my life as well. Let me say that I, I'm providing a bit of a transition between the last panel and, and this one that's coming up. I'm a law professor, a political scientist, and also a practitioner in this area. I often say that you can tell when I'm being a law professor because I have opinions without data. You can tell when I'm being a political scientist because I have data without opinions. I uh, don't want to be a lawyer because it depends what my client wants me to say. So I, I can talk about each one of these sort of areas. I do some work with, uh, not as uh, paid work, but I do some work with the platforms uh, as uh, so many people who, who you've heard from uh, today and can talk a little bit about that. What I want to start by talking about though is to try to abstract out a bit about the sort of meta problems that I think uh, we're identifying. And the first, let me put my law professor hat on, which is that a core element of First Amendment law in the United States has been that the marketplace of ideas is the best test for truth. Right? It's not clear that that's ever been the case, but it's certainly not the case in uh, the new world of the internet. And so uh, it is not the case that the more speech that is out there, the more likely that true beliefs will then uh, win out. And I think that, that challenge is one that we're, we're sort of all grappling with uh, below the surface. Related to that is whether, and, and again, putting on my political scientist hat here, is whether democracy requires some kind of basic agreement on facts and some minimal trust in institutions, including the media, right? It is certainly the case, and all of you have, have highlighted this in the previous session, that we, you know, we, we are quick to blame the internet for all kinds of problems that both pre-existed it uh, and have a long pedigree. Right, so I'm looking at the Gallup polls, not only that you all have done, but that Gallup has done on confidence in these institutions over time. There's been a monotonic decrease in trust since the 1960s and 70s. That being said, it's important, I think, to look at the unique features of this technological revolution and how it's having an impact on uh, sort of democracy-related speech and, and the, the types of values that I'm talking about. And third, related to that is, we often have thought of democracy, the sort of conversation in a democracy being limited to people in that country, which is to say humans, not bots, uh, and domestic nationals as opposed to foreigners. And so the challenge that this past election has shown and, and, and uh, our conversation since then is that we are, are confronting what are new challenges that are, that, uh, are exacerbated by the World Wide Web uh, that we cannot identify who the speaker is or where they're coming from. So those are, I think, the kind of meta problems. Let me talk a little bit about what I say are the unique features. And, and again, it's important to uh, isolate those, uh, what is new as opposed mm. to some of these age old problems. But often when I give this talk um, or a talk like this, I get three particular criticisms. One is what you think is new is actually old, right? So we've had fake news as long as we've had news, right? We've had hate speech as long as we've had speech. So the question is, well, what, what has changed? The second is, what you think is bad is actually good, and you all have highlighted this in the, in the previous panel, which is that, look, the, the same technology that allows you to have 
a uh, network among carpentry aficionados is also the one that uh, leads to um, a, you know extremist groups to have their communities. Sorry. <laughs> this is the <laughs> halftime show. Uh, Thank you, Charlie. Excellent. <laughs> um, I blame Google. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, so, so what are these unique features of the, of the internet that are, are are posing these challenges? And then I'll talk a little bit about the solutions. Um, the first is sort of the family of issues that we were talking about before: uh, virality, velocity, and volume. Right. The fact that information is traveling much quicker than it ever did before. The amount of information that we have access to uh, uh, requires mediation that isn't there. And so what is mediating the information that we are and communication that we are receiving? And that is peer to peer sharing. Right. And so gone are the days when Walter Cronkite could say at the end of a broadcast, that's just the way it is, because now no one believes anyone who says that's just the way it is. And most of the people who are transferring that information to you are not these uh, legacy media institutions. It's more of your friends and the social networks. Second is the problem of homophily that Richard mentioned before, homophily being echo chambers, filter bubbles. There's actually a, a good debate as to whether our online lives are really more politically segregated than our offline lives. Um, we are more politically segregated in the United States than uh, we have been in the last 50 years or so. Um, nevertheless, what say 4chan and Reddit and, and let alone uh, other social networking groups provide is the ability to self-segregate and to uh, reinforce your previous opinions uh, that satisfy your sort of news appetite. Third is the anonymity problem, and that is um, related, that's what gives us the bot problem, that's what gives us the hate speech problem, that, and, and it's part of a larger phenomenon, right, which is that information and communication is ripped from its source, right? So that you do not have the same offline cues that we have to evaluate credibility and information that we do in the, uh, you know, for example, if you were to go to a supermarket <laughs> checkout stand and you were to see certain publications as you approach the register, we discount them based on the location and type of publication that they are. When you get a homogenized news feed that basically treats a cat video from your grandmother in the same way that it does a story about the Kardashians as well as a Breitbart uh, article and a news, uh, New York Times article, right? All of that information is basically sent to you in the same format with the offline <coughs> cues basically being ripped away. <coughs> Fourth is the problem of monopoly, which you all have talked about. Let me, just, let me now put my law professor hat on and talk, just gesture on the issue of antitrust for a second, which is that the traditional tools of antitrust, I think, actually don't work well in this environment. Because you, you could punish these companies with certain types of you know, fines and the like. That doesn't get at this problem that you all are talking about. Um, because the problem is the product. It's not so much the company, which is to say a search engine or a news feed is where they get their power. Right? So we could, you could prevent Facebook from combining with Instagram. You could prevent Google from marketing its products through um, uh, and privileging them in the newsfeed uh, or in the, or in the uh, search results. But it doesn't get to the critical problem, which is that the eyeballs are flocking to those websites. And so long as in those particular products uh, information is organized in a particular way, then the rules that those companies adopt are essentially the law of the internet. Finally is the issue of sovereignty, and this goes back to a little bit to government regulation, which is that we do not have the ability, that, that domestic governments are constrained in their ability to regulate the information that's coming sort of over their borders, as it were. Um, there is, I think, a open question as to whether the future of the internet is going to be determined by sort of the free speech ideology of China, Europe, or the United States. My colleague at Ar Oxford, Timothy Garton Ash, has written a, a sort of whole book on this, and um, I think it's, it's really, we can talk a little bit more about that it's from the regulatory perspective uh, afterwards, but it's becoming increasingly difficult, I think, um, to envision a world in the U.S. where you, the U.S. government is regulating it um, uh, in ways um, that are inconsistent with our, with our First Amendment rules. Now let me talk a little bit about the solutions in, in the one minute I have uh, remaining, um, which is that you can, and, and there are three arenas, I think, of, of solutions. One is government regulation, and it may be that Europe is going to be the tail that wags the dog here, uh, so that the internet companies will be, have to follow, uh, as they have on privacy and some other things, um, the rules that, that Europe is, is imposing on them. But we, we shall see. 
The second is the firms themselves, and we've all talked about this. That, uh, and, and I should say that the terms of service and the community guidelines that um, Twitter, Facebook, and Google have all would violate the First Amendment if they were legislated by Congress, right? Um, and that's okay. These are private firms. You know, they, they, their rules on hate speech, their rules on obscenity, incitement, intellectual property violation, and the like, all of those um, are not the constitutional standards, and uh, there are reasons for that. And, and so the question I think that we're often asking is whether um, we should add something to those to that mix, whether it's dealing with, with disinformation, whether it's dealing with echo chambers and the like. Is there something beyond those categories that I was mentioning before? Um, but in addition to the government and the firms, there's us, right, which is civil society. And to some extent, we're going to talk about that a little bit here. I had the privilege a month ago of um, speaking at the NATO PSYOPs conference, something I never thought I'd end up uh, doing as a, as a law professor. Um, when I was invited to NATO PSYOPs conference, I was thinking, you know, someplace in Brussels. It turned out it was in Tampa, uh, you know, so, so um, uh, you know, but I'll take it where I can get it. Um, uh, and, but, and they were sort of interested, in, and, and all the talk there was about inoculation theory, right, and building resilience. And to some extent, when we talk about um, civics education and uh, teaching these kinds of skills, and we have a huge project here that you all are helping funding through, through our project, uh, that Sam Weinberg in the education department here at Stanford's uh, doing, on trying to teach uh, these, these civic skills to high school students and the like. So what are the, the, the sort of levers where we could see these three different actors trying to, to press to improve the situation? Um, I mentioned before censorship and deletion, and while that has a terrible ring to it, as I was saying, this is what the platforms do already. There is a whole range of speech which is not allowed on, on the platforms, and the question is, should that be expanded to some of these other areas? And of course, there are, this is incredibly fraught, because if it has a disparate impact based on ideology and the like, we can see uh, what the objections would be. Second is disclosure, right? So there's, it, I think in the last year, the, uh, uh, the zeal which, with, with which the platforms have approached this problem is to pro provide more information. The early research is showing that's not having much of an effect, that when you, disc when you have these fake news flags on a website, it doesn't seem, if anything, it leads to um, more engagement because it's like, oh, this is fake, let me figure it out, let me look at it, right? Uh, and it, it unreasonably gives sort of greater uh, credibility to the things that on the website that aren't flagged. So a lot of what, what the, the firms are looking at, and this is what, what I think has come out in the, uh, the new efforts by Facebook, is, is demotion, right? What, how do you uh, decide that low quality information should be placed lower down than higher quality information, again, with all of the issues that are, are fraught in, in determining information quality? Fourth, and this is something that, that uh, the Europeans are better able to do than we are, and that is um, dilution, uh, which is to try to dilute the effect of bad information with good information. Now, the reason they're in a better position is that with robust public broadcasting and public news operations, they are able to sort of send signals as, uh, uh, as governments, as, as a society, about uh, prioritizing some types of information over others. Next, let me just say one thing about uh, uh, some research that's also going on here at Stanford um, that Jennifer Pan has been doing. Um, uh, and this looks at the effect of distraction and diversion on people's uh, uh, consumption of uh, disinformation. Um, that what she shows, we tend to think about what's happening in China as being about deletion censorship and um, uh, that that most of what they're doing is banning information. What she shows is actually so much of what the, the government there is doing is distracting us toward, distracting the populace toward different types of uh, conversations and information. And you might think that is, that look, that can be done for good or for ill, but the, dis the decision to recommend certain websites, to recommend certain conversations is a way of steering uh, people's attention toward certain uh, outcomes. Lastly, is this idea of deterrence. I mentioned that this talk I gave before the NATO PSYOPs conference. The, um, so there are classic deterrence techniques, if you think about it, if we're talking about Russian disinformation uh, campaigns. But one of the things that we've seen in the last year is that Google and Facebook have, ha have tried right, to deter some of these bad actors. For example, the famous Macedonian teenagers case, right, where uh, the, you know, a group of Macedonian uh, teenagers uh, had been putting up fake news websites in order to make money. 
And uh, what Google and Facebook figured out a way to do was to deprive them uh, of their ad revenue, right? And so in all of these areas, there are different levers. You could see the government taking, you could see civil society taking, or you could see the, the platforms taking. And, and since it's, it's so easy to end on a, a very sour note, as all of us do when we talk about this problem, the amount of innovation and experimentation that's occurring in this area is truly remarkable, right? And so I began writing this book on democracy and the internet four years ago. The entire subject has changed, okay? <laughs> uh, and, and so that while what we sort of are focused is sort of stewing in our juices because of, of these particular problems, um, what we will be talking about next year might be very different than what we're talking about this year. Sally? Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um. Thank you. You're addressing such critical issues, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Um, the question that you posed for this panel is, had to do with, is news literacy a solution? And in fact, I strongly believe that it is, and that's why I'm building the Trust Project. Um, I think it is a solution if you give pub the public the tools for evaluation to really sh to show the public what is distinct about journalism and how to know when journalism is trustworthy. So in essence, to create that foundation uh, for Gina's network of trust that she talked about. So what I'd like to do is tell you briefly about the Trust Project, a little bit about our results and the foundational research we did, because I think it will inform what you're doing, and then uh, just have a, a couple of thoughts. So the Trust Project is a consortium of news organizations working together to develop a system of transparency standards that show what is distinct about journalism. Um, 75 news organizations work together, top editors to think about what they are and to define them based upon information that we had <coughs> gathered from users in Europe and the US from one-on-one -on -one interviews. And what it create, what it is, is a set of user-facing standards that the public can see, and you can use an example on your slides there, and then also technical vocabulary that the algorithms can read. So in our research, we started with user research because we really wanted to know what it, how to solve this problem because it's not a new problem in journalism. Trust is not a new problem in journalism. So we talked to people um, in the across race, class, gender, generation, and geography. And I divide the, what our results uh, found into four user types, which who I will introduce to you. The first is the avid news user. And this person will go out there and search for the news everywhere, check and cross-check the news, and then push it out there once they feel like it is trustworthy. Um, and then, you know, I do not understand why people do not read the news. Might as well put your finger in the lights in a light socket. Then we have the engaged news user who is at, wants to be informed, maybe even subscribes to one or two publications uh, in print or online, but is overwhelmed. There's too much out there. Then we have the opportunistic user who's just letting news flood over them. They also want to know what's going on around the world, around the neighborhood, and need the news, but there's a lot of uncertainty about what to trust, what not to trust. And, um, but there's a sense that the news isn't providing everything we need. So for instance, Wendy here is looking at uh, the television news when it comes on, and she's also got her Latino politics site that she checks online all the, on their phone. And then we have the angry and disengaged. And one of the points I want to make about this is that we tend to focus a lot on the angry, the disengaged, and what I'd like to do, us to do is think about the avid, the engaged, and the opportunistic, because those folks really do want to be informed, and those are the folks that I think we can, we can, we can move. Um, so the other element that we recognize across all of these four types is they do have similar needs. They do have similar wants that they describe. What is the agenda behind the news people talk about, people ask? We know journalists try to be independent, to be objective, but everybody's got an agenda. Who is this journalist? What is uh, behind this journalist? What is their expertise? Diverse perspectives. We heard from people, again, across the board. We want to hear from people like us and also unlike us. We want to hear from more than just people in business and government. What's the source? How was this story built? And um, I believe it was Gina was talking about this, the expectation, let us participate. So a desire to engage with the news, both on the page and off the page, to help guide it, to shape it, to challenge it. So that's where the trust indicators come from. And um, as I said, news organizations gathered around these, these 
ideas and came up with 37 trust indicators or indicators of trustworthiness and narrowed them down to eight pilot indicators. And I give you a handout because it describes them um, in, in the analog fashion, but here's an example. These are all examples of what they look like. So La Repubblica is showing the best practices standards here. So what is your ethics policy, your commitment to diverse voices, your corrections policy, all those kinds of things that, that show the standards that make journalism distinct. The author page, uh, this is not an author page, actually this is an article page from Mike that is showing a little bit more about the author so people can immediately assess who is this author? What is Emily's body of work? How can I contact her? The Economist is showing that uh, how is the story built? So every site is going to do this a little differently and not on all stories, but here they've put a list of their citations right at the bottom of the page. Here is labeling the story. Is it news? Is it analysis? Is it opinion? Is it paid content by an advertiser? So simple yet so critical. And the Washington Post is showing this is analysis, and there, if you um, click on the analysis tab, then you find out uh, the definition of analysis, and that is a trust project shared definition there. So um, this system can only work if the platforms are also using it, and we have four that have agreed to use it, and this is just an example of how Facebook is, is testing uh, the trust indicators in their news feed, showing um, the best standard, best practices here. So do these work? I have, I, so far we're finding very encouraging news. We did a, or the Engaging News Project, Center for Media Engagement, now they've changed their name. They did a study using the trust indicators, an A-B study, and they found with 1,100 people, some half of them seeing the trust indicators, half of them not, and they found statistically significant differences in attitudes once people had seen these trust indicators. They felt they were more likely to feel that the site could be trusted, that it is reputable, that it tells the whole story, and that it's reliable. They also, um, there was also a different feeling about the reporter, that the reporter was, was more, um, had spent more time uh, researching the article and was well qualified to write it. And there are other behavioral attitude changes as well, which I can go into if you have questions. So um, in conclusion, what I'd like to just say is these trust indicators actually are quite simple. It's important that they are coming from the news industry itself based on what the public has said that they care about, and, but they're also married with traditional journalistic values. And they get to how is the story built and who did it come from. And they're founded in this idea of journalistic responsibility, this idea that journalism really is a propellant for democracy, but we need the people to be participating in order for that to happen. So there's a responsibility to the public and there's a, a commitment to public engagement and ownership. So a couple of these trust indicators go a little bit further than what journalism is doing right now, for instance, in public engagement as in um, diverse voices. And I think the, I've, the industry is stepping up to it. So thank you. So actually, there was one more thing I wanted to say. So I think with our trust, uh, with those, what we've learned about the different populations, instead of focusing on the disengaged, we really want to think about how do we ignite those avid folks and push them down into activating the interested and then interest the angry. And I think that's something that the commission can really think about and engage with and uh, use it as a tool to move forward. Here are the trust indicators. Thank you. Do I make the slides go? Do the slides yeah. just go? Yeah, just proceed. <clears throat> Meanwhile, um, it's really it's super fun to be up here because there's so many colleagues and um, collaborators up here. But my favorite is actually Perry and I went to junior high together back in New York City. And he was a big skateboarder. That was sort of my, my main memory of that. Okay. So um, um, my name is Jennifer Lee. I'm a, a co-founder of uh, a group called the Credibility Coalition. 
which is an initiative that's led by Medan and Hex Hackers. And to give you some, some sort of some background, it actually grew out of a conference um, at MIT called MissInfoCon that was co-hosted uh, generously by Ethan um, at the MIT Media Lab. And MissInfoCon basically took place in February of last year. And the idea was to bring together a lot of different people to explore and to do things, right? So it was sort of the spirit of a hackathon, but not all of the uh, ideas had to be technical. And the way, um, and it grew out of Hacks Hackers, which is a, a sort of a grassroots group um, that has about 50,000 members across uh, over 100 chapters on six continents. And you know, among our most popular chapters are London and Buenos Aires. And a new chapter that we're really proud of is Havana. Um, and then there's a lot of activity in Africa. And the idea is it's, it's very much from the ground up. And um, what we want, and the way it started was actually was texting with a friend of mine who's a wife of a Facebook um, a Facebook co-founder, and she was very kind of distraught after the end of um, the election last year and was was trying to save the republic. And so um, was kind of give, giving support to lots of different causes. And I asked her, um, you know, would you be interested in funding a conference about fake news at MIT? And she's like, sure, how much? And I was like, 50? And uh, she's like, done. So 50,000, all over text, and sort of you get the ball rolling. And it's really nice to have sort of fast, flexible money in a time when there's a lot of kind of experimentation going on. So, um, you know, Knight came in, uh, Craig Newmark came in, and Mazzilla came in. And uh, what was sort of key was, you know, we had teams of people working on solutions. It was very interdisciplinary, which is one of the key things, because you have different groups who have problems and other people who, you know, know that can, like, think about solutions. Um, and so, for example, uh, you know, I was talking to someone about a machine learning challenge, and, they're, and they basically said, well, one of the big problems is that the data is three years old. It's not very good data. And I was like, well, why don't we just build a new data set? But it's not necessarily the way that an engineer thinks, like, the data is there or the data is not there, right? So um, what happened at MissInfoCon was there was a large number of projects that kind of all came to this idea of credibility assessment, right? Which is like, and then you kind of have credibility assessment, um, whether or not it was in, you know, ad tech or it was in sort of, you know, within social or within like search or whatever. But we, we found essentially um, there was this need and we had a late night session um, on the Saturday night. And... So we basically, out of that, you know, we had some extra money from Miss InfoCon, and so Hex Hackers put in about $5,000 to sort of get the ball rolling. And so the idea of what we identified as sort of a, a very key thing to move the needle was um, the... You, you, we wanted some sort of technical sort of schema or framework for third party third party assessment, so not first party assessment of stories and their credibility, in part to inform platforms and AI initiatives. And out of that also was this idea that um, we would also create a larger data set. So you know. It started with a sort of a, a working group, and this is actually one of the key things of having interdisciplinary uh, teams, which is the original name of this organization was the Credibility Indicators Working Group, which is what happens when you let engineers name things. So we came up with Credibility mm -hmm. Coalition with a lot, you know, kind of, with a lot of like voting and like thumbs up on Slack. So um, our core go goals are to sort of identify certain kind of indicators of trust, like things are like, does it, you know, does it cite anonymous sources? Does it use inflammatory? language? Does it, um, you know, is this organization something that has won a lot of journalism awards in the past? Then um, it's also key to us that we wanted to establish um, cooperation and a working process across all, every, everyone, so that we're not working at odds, that things remain kind of consistent among all the groups who are sort of interested in this area. And then the last thing was this idea of creating like a, a robust set of testing data which then can be used to train uh, whatever algorithms need to be trained. So the key thing is the what we're doing is not creating the black box algorithm. We are kind of basically defining the little tick boxes for, for the platforms or whatnot to then go make their own uh, black box algorithms, but it's sort of a comprehensive assessment of what could be important. So we actually had meetings in New York and San Francisco where we basically had people brainstorm. Um, you know, we had basically, you know, you know, ideas 
coming from different directions. So for example, is the organization insured? Do they have E&O insurance? Like that's sort of a very subtle thing, but can actually, errors and emissions insurance, and does it, but it can tell you about how professional an organization is. And so we just kind of kept on brainstorming, brainstorming. We, we used a lot of post-it notes, which are very expensive, by the way, in part because I think like 3M has some like tremendous patent. Uh, in New York, we actually had bagels, which are terrible in the, in the West Coast. And these are actually from a, a, a store called Nussbaum and Wu, which very big fat bagels. Um, and so, you know, we basically kind of grouped the indicators into, you know, things around the structure of the of the article, you know, the internal content of the article, and then also the people that are involved. So, as you, we took all those post-it notes, we kind of were able to group them over and over again. So, what was nice was uh, we got a fifty thousand dollar night prototype grant, um, and that kind of basically allowed us to turbocharge and go on the road. So we had a MissInfoCon in uh, London, and also kind of did an exercise with people trying to help help them uh, as kind of come up with indicators. And so one of the things that we would often do is have people read articles, like some that are very controversial, some that are not, and, and, and push them on like, why do you trust it? Like, what, what is it that makes you think that this is something to care about? Um, we also went to the W3C in San Francisco. This was back in November and had a couple sessions. Uh, there is Jeff Chang from Google, who's in chart, who's a product manager around the issues of fake news and Tessa lines from uh, Facebook kind of participated in, remotely. And then we also went to News Guys, which many people here um, have been on, uh, have have been to, and, and there was a sort of session between with me and Sally um, on technical standards and credibility. So who's in the group? Um, it's a very grassroots group. Anyone can can join in the same way that for Miss Infocon, anyone could have applied to join um, or to go to Miss Infocon. Actually. Uh, Four of the, the leaders in the group are women of color and two of them um, being the technical technical leads as well. So it's you know people from the platforms, it's people from journalism organizations, it's academics, it's a real, it's a real fun um, mix, and we basically are very active on Slack and also have um, um, a, a lot of in-person meetings and hangouts. Uh, there's a weekly hangout meeting for an hour every Thursday. So from this, we, we wanted to build a pilot in part because there was an academic um, paper deadline in January, so just literally just last week. And so it was this idea of like, you know, what can we learn? Can we actually do a whole loop of the process of like coming, you know, coming up with credibility um, sort of schema? like annotating articles and then seeing if those things basically indicate um, credibility in line with people who have greater expertise. So what was really nice is among the people in our group, um, there are a number of annotation platforms, Check Public Editor and Hypothesis, so they, that, that was really nice. Right? So we didn't necessarily have to build technology from scratch. It was very small, 30 articles, six annotators, and only 13 indicators, but um, the, findings, at least on initial level, are very promising. So for example, um, certain things that are correlated with credibility, either positive or negative, was emotionally charged tone, or whether or not the clickbait, the title was very clickbaity. Um, and also, you know, how robust were the citations in terms of um, citing outside sources. So um, for, with regard to advertising, one of the interesting things that we discovered was the quantity of the ads did not actually distinguish credibility and non-credible content, but the aggressiveness of those ads and the placements and calls to action actually did correlate um, more with credible and non-credible content. And um, what we actually, well, actually one of the most promising things was as, as the um, annotators who were journalism students kind of went through the exercise, by the end, they actually had a much more sophisticated um, understanding of credibility and aligned basically more closely with those of the domain experts. So we actually had focused on um, climate change and health articles, science and health articles, in part because those were um, highly shared, and there was sort of an objective sort of criteria in terms of the the science that was behind it or was cited. So we took the 50 most shared articles in those areas and sort of knocked out a bunch and ended up those um, 30. So you know, possible use cases are, uh, for example, in web search. Um, you know, if something has low credibility, perhaps it shouldn't be necessarily highlighted in the, the boxes that Google sometimes puts up. It could actually have a you know a sort of depressing effect on whether or not something in social media should be um, sort of like accelerated in in sharing power. 
Um, so we have a lot of you know, potential research paths. I think this idea of actually making people go through the process of assessing articles as a way of both contributing to creating you know, a, a large data set that can be used um, by the platforms and also as a byproduct improve those people's individual um, notions of credibility is, is very powerful. And so um, if we get in, it will be presented at a web conference in April or May in Lyon, France, and the lead author of that was Amy Dang, who is um, a PhD student at MIT. So that's Thank you, Jennifer. Esther. Well, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. My place of work is literally across the street, Palo Alto High School. And I've been doing this for 34 years. And when I first started, I had a typewriter. I'm not kidding. And hot wax and a few other exciting things like that. I handed out X-Acto knives to everybody. Imagine doing that today. <laughs> so today we face a new problem. OK, back then, we didn't have this problem. State should require schools to teach media literacy to combat fake news. Everybody's doing this. How media literacy is critical to saving our democracy. These are just a few headlines. There's tons of them. Forgotten purpose, civics, education, and public schools. OK, let's take a look here. This is something very important for everybody to look at. Contrary to popular belief, the problem isn't that students receive no civics education. All 50 states require it. All 50 states. 90% of the students take at least one civics course. So what happened? What's going on? It's all theoretical. It is not tied to the real world. They're reading a book, memorizing the stuff, and taking a test at the end of the week. That is a problem. It's really pretty sad. So we have efforts. This is from Google. This is a great one. Just came out, actually, two days ago. They are teaching digital literacy training to teachers for free. Maybe that'll help. Never know. But then look at what else is coming. So Google has this great toy that you can play with. It's kind of a website called Interland that will teach you to be suspicious of stuff that you find on the web. So how many people will this affect? Let's try. 50 million students in grades K through 12. We should be working on the kids. They're a captive audience, right? They, they don't have a choice. Let's give them an opportunity to do something fun. This works. It's a game. By the way, there are 20 million kids or human beings in college. 20 million. We should be targeting them, too. What are we doing? Nothing. Well, little. Let's put it that way. All right. If we want kids to learn, learning has to be active. So this is what I specialize in. What makes people learn? How do they learn something? They have to be self-directed. The whole system today is not self-directed. Most kids are told what to do all the time, constantly. And so how excited are they about that? The question is, why aren't more journalism programs popular around the United States? Anybody know? Let me tell you the answer. I found out last October. It's because the person in charge is not the kids. It's the teacher. Who wants to work for the teacher? Nobody, unfortunately. They want to work for themselves. So here's what I do. Okay, I use media studies at Palo Alto High School as a platform to teach students digital literacy and writing and thinking and a few other things as byproducts. More schools should do that. Actually, they're, they're copying. This is what I have today. This is a beautiful building. You're all welcome to come and see it. It's right across the street. It's the Media Arts Center. I should just tell you, for 30 years, I was in a portable. 
So I built this, yes, I built this program in a portable. You don't need to have a beautiful building. This is kind of my reward, thank you. So happy with the people from Palo Alto. <laughs> Today, we have over 600 students, 10 publications, newspapers, magazines, TV, websites, radio, everything. We're starting a sports, a um, science magazine, and a travel magazine this fall. Whose idea was that? Not mine. It's the kids. The kids are totally in charge of everything. So that makes the difference. That's where learning takes place. And so in order to teach digital literacy to all these kids, all these 50 million, that's what we need to do. Give them some control. Let them do a little blog. It's free. So this is what journalists learn. I don't really have to tell all of you because you're all journalists, but I have to tell other people. Because they like, why well, want to teach journalism? What, what's in it for me or them or whatever? How about they gather information from primary sources, they analyze it, determine what's most important. Do you know how long it takes for kids to figure that out? <laughs> it takes forever. They want me to tell them what's most important. And the reason they want me to tell them is just like they don't want to come up with their own story idea. Why not? They want an A story idea. And if it, they won't take it if it's not an A story idea. They were like, oh my god, I might get a B. <laughs> How terrible. Anyway, and then they have to write it up succinctly and then publish online. They learn all the skills for the 21st century doing that. So I'd like to suggest that this be supported. This is my own personal methodology for doing it in the class. It's called trick. It's just exactly the opposite of what's going on in most schools. It's called trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. I trust them all. I cannot go out and do the reporting for them. They have to do the reporting themselves. And I make it very clear, we don't want to get sued, ever. So I also use, thank you very much, Sally, for all those that trust thing, we use it in class. We talk about standards, authors, sources, and we basically are very suspicious of anything emotionally charged. And today, there's a lot of that. You have to be very suspicious, but thank you for that. So students also learn the soft skills. Look at what Google hires today. They're not just looking for people with STEM skills. They're looking for people that can actually collaborate and think and talk and innovate. And so this program, it could happen everywhere. And they don't all have to teach these wonderful, exciting, you'll see what, uh, what I produce. They can just do blogs. So the value of civics education goes far beyond politics, as you know, voting, volunteer work, public speaking, thinking, debate, this is what my class looks like. Notice they are not sitting in a row. And notice the teacher, it's hard to find the teacher. That's because it's all collaborative, and that's what journalism is. If you go into a newsroom, do you see the editor standing up in front of the newsroom talking to everybody? No. This is another picture of the class. Notice the teacher is in the back. This is what they produce. OK, they produce. Work that is, it's hard to believe, is produced by kids. But if they're given the freedom, this is, I can't emphasize it enough, they will do it. This is an example. It comes out every two weeks. It's a newspaper. This is the center of that newspaper, all produced by kids. This is a magazine. This is one of the 10. It's called C Magazine. We copied the New York Times. T Magazine. Thank you, New York Times. This is um, Verde, this is another magazine. This is all produced by students. So my suggestion here for dealing with this whole problem that we have is giving kids more opportunity to work independently and giving that they can publish online. They don't have to publish in hard copy like my kids do. There's so many places to publish online. It's so easy and they learn digital skills and put them in charge. And I can just tell you, one of the main things, one of the inhibiting factors, it's a little upsetting, is that the school administration, they don't really want to know what the kids have to think. 
And so it's called censorship. It's the Hazelwood decision. Supreme Court, Hazelwood decision. Do you know who's in charge? The advisor and the principal get to censor, except in about eight states that are anti-Hazelwood states. Which one of them is California. So my students have total control. And if they would be here, I wish they could be here, they would tell you that's true. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Esther. And folks, just feel free to prop your name tags up and we'll get to questions. Nate, I've got a question for you, if that works. Actually, a request and then a question. Um, one, I appreciate your, your uh, recognition of the use of alliteration to make a point. Um, <laughs> deletion, disclosure, demotion, dilution, deterrence, distraction, and diversion. I, it, I, I got it. Now I want more. So the first request is, as you've listed out these potentials, the relative pros and cons, or level of impact or not, to the extent that in a follow-up to this, I'd love more thinking on this. I don't think we've got the time to do it now. I'm going to focus on one of them, um, but I'd really love more uh, because you, you made some comments about relative importance uh, or impact on some of them, and I'd, I'd love to know more. Specifically on kind of as we think about the last conversation and this business of the rules of antitrust, um, uh, traditional rules don't really apply here. Would love for you to talk a little bit about one, we don't have, we haven't had any conversations as a group on is regulatory policy uh, an area that we want to go in as a, rec a series of recommendations. I'd love your thoughts, though, on if the traditional antitrust regulatory structure isn't the right way, what could be productive in this quest for addressing a crisis of trust? What does that look like? Um, and do you have any thoughts on the relative impact of regulatory action? So, you know, we're, we're, we've got a Scylla and Charybdis problem here, which is that on the one hand, we don't trust the corporations, but on the other hand, we trust the government even less, right? And so the idea of a White House Office of Information Integrity is something that I think sends chill up many of our spines. And so, the, but, that, but that's not responsive to you, because in an ideal world, what, what, what might this look like? And there are different types of levers, policy levers, that I think could be push. I spend a lot of time because I do a lot of, as you said at, at the in my intro, I do a lot of work on specifically law and politics and, and campaigns. So there's certain, there's legislation that's out there about forcing disclosure, for example, in online advertising. So the advertising space is one that's ripe for um, uh, regulation, right? And and I, I actually think this is low-hanging fruit for the platforms. This is one where they, they can actually go out front. I think Facebook is actually going to be even more um, aggressive here than the what's proposed the Warner Klobuchar rule on um, uh, political ads. So advertising is an, an area that's easy. Um, on disinformation generally, it, it's hard, right? Because it, you don't want the government to be in charge of uh, being the referee for truth, right? And so, so that I think is is challenging. There are, however, sort of different things here and there. One of them, I mean, as as, as the specifically on the issue of bots and foreign. Um, intervention, uh, the decertification, or the, the forcing of websites like RT and, and Sputnik to register under the uh, FARA law, right, is an example of where the government has actually uh, gotten involved. Um, algorithmic transparency, which has been talked about a bit here, is something I, I am really trying to wrap my head around what that would look like, because the, it's not like Google and Facebook are just going to say, well, here are all the factors that then um, are used to prioritize certain items over another because the minute you do that then actors in the system behave in a particular way to, to thwart that and so um, some kind of, of third party uh, uh, sort of neutral body that could uh, monitor in some ways uh, uh, how the platforms are behaving I think is useful and I think there to some extent they're coming a, a, along on this at least I, don't, I know more about Facebook in the last year than uh, Google that I had done some work with previous to that, getting um, uh, some outsiders to provide that kind of, uh, that kind of advice and, and vouching for it. Um, as I said, the, it may be that the Europeans are going to be leading the way here, and I do worry about that, because um, the German fake news bill, as well as the, the proposal that Macron has recently put out there, um, are really disconcerting, partly because they don't make the critical decisions that need to be made. It is extreme. I have tried to write a law that would get at this problem, 
right? You can't do it, right? You, you can't do it without sort of the obvious First Amendment um, uh, collateral damage that, that, that all of us, I think, would find disconcerting. The European approach has been to say, all right, and this is the German law, um, Google and Facebook will, will well, any platform um, with a certain number of users will uh, face a 50 million euro fine for any illegal speech act that occurs on their platform that they're notified about 40 and, and don't take down within 48 hours, right? Now, that puts then Google and Facebook in this terrible position of having to be over-inclusive because they can't do it with, through human monitoring, really. They're going to have to use AI in order to get at that kind of speech. And so... Um, while it's going to be easy for cases of things like Holocaust denial and, and, and classic hate speech stuff to then, they're going to end up being sort of over-inclusive on things like defamation and, and the like. So, so there are, I think, it, there isn't a kind of blanket law. Um, there, there is, we're, we're publishing something actually through the Knight Project here. Tim uh, Huang uh, wrote a piece for us on reforming the Communications Decency Act to go at particular parts of the problem. Actually, it's on our website um, uh, at, at our project. So, so there is a lot there, and I should say in, in, um, in terms of uh, giving you more on this, so, so I should say that it's, I, I have a longer, t I tried to compress about two hours into, a, into eight minutes there. Uh, on the Aspen Institute website, on the Aspen Ideas Festival website, you've got my longer uh, uh, talk on this, and I uh, uh, wrote an article last year called Can Democracy Survive the Internet? I'll just say this, the answer may surprise you, you know, so. <laughs> so well, they will, we'll add that to our learning agenda yeah. as a commission. Um, with that, Mazel? Thanks, Jamie. I wanted to uh, pose the, the question in terms of the evolution of the concept of, of a gatekeeper. Uh, you know, Esther, I'm very fond of saying that I learned everything uh, about running a news organization that I needed to know when I was in high school. Uh, and yes. <laughs> Bravo. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very, uh, very pleased and impressed with your with your program. Uh, but you know. How do you introduce the concept of gatekeeper to your students, or is that even part of is that is that even part of your teaching? Uh, and and over time, uh, you know, it, would it be more accurate to say? Uh, and uh, I'm interested also in Sally and, and Jennifer's opinion on this. Uh, would it be more accurate to say that uh, the the concept of a gatekeeper has evolved to take? Uh, algorithms uh, into account and and would uh, the trust indicators and the credibility project really be a more of a technical gatekeeper solution uh, and uh, and bringing Nate into this uh, are regulations such as the fairness doctrine you know essentially um, you know an element of regulation that that governs the act of gatekeeping so we'll start with Esther so I let my students evaluate and be gatekeepers themselves. I teach them what needs to be done, that they always have to get sources. They've got to get sources on both sides and evaluate it themselves. Um, I actually am the final gatekeeper. But I don't really exert that unless they bring it to my attention. Because I have like 60 kids in the class, and this paper is 28 pages long, three sections. It's hard to read every single word. So I have to trust them to do the right thing. And um, for all these years, I have actually, it's done, worked out well. Not only that, um, they know what to look for in another story. They always look for whether there are sources on both sides and uh, a news story. And then they're very careful about the opinion pieces to always make sure that they get quotes on both sides. So I'm teaching a kind of journalism, I think, that maybe it doesn't exist that much in the real world. I don't think, I don't know. Because um, they're, they're cautious, and then they look for that themselves. Um, so that's where that thing that I say trick, I use trust, respect. I trust them to do the right thing. I mean, I think my number one problem has been, you know, sometimes, you know, they're teenagers, and so they, I have the biggest problem with columns where they tell jokes that are um, maybe not so appropriate. Um, and, you know, but they're not hurting anybody except the principal gets really mad. Um, but that's about it, you know. I, I really don't have any other 
major problems, and they cover everything. I mean, in 1996, the story they covered resulted in the resignation of the superintendent. So they do not shy away from important stories. Um, Sally. Okay. Yeah, so I see the Trust Project as um, responding to the evolution of the gatekeeper idea, if you will, because we think about journalism has always thought of itself as a gatekeeper of information and of shaping information in such a way to, that it will enhance democratic debate and also making decisions about what information is accurate and, how, and who is telling the, the, who are, I should say, are telling truth. So, but now we have the public also playing a critical role via these social networks and via search. So on the one hand, what we're doing is bolstering an understanding of journalists, the role of journalism as a gatekeeper. So I think what's happened is the idea of journalism has devolved a bit in the sense of the public seeing journalism as more of a censor than an actual um, assist in trying to understand the world around us. A censor, or a, in other words, um, avoiding ideas that ought to be discussed or t being highly partisan in one way or another. Um, so by revealing and becoming more transparent about what are the uh, aspects of journalism that underpin it and make it distinct from other kinds of information, then we help reshape that view and help people understand that this really is um, a unique enterprise designed to, to serve debate and that the people involved do follow ethical standards and policies and you can find out more about them. On the other hand, there's the, the public participation element. So we can't just rely on journalism to do that anymore. And journalism hasn't always been that great because there have been many groups that have been left out of journalism over the years. So now, as I see the Trust Project, what we're doing is inviting the public back in. We really were founded with, based on um, public research, as I showed you. Now we're bringing the public back in to help um, guide, if you will, and become more of a participatory force in holding journalism accountable, in um, helping us think about well, what those elements, those indicators of trustworthiness, and are they the right ones? Should we reshape them? And, um, and helping one another think about what are the aspects of journalism that matter to us and how can we create kind of a network of trust, as, as I said, as Gina was talking about. Can I just say something else here? I can tell you that most teachers of other subjects don't know the difference between an editorial, an opinion piece, and a news story. Okay, so those are teachers. Let's just look at the general public it's pretty bad. Unless they can figure this out, they're never going to trust anything because they're like, oh, they, they make mistakes all the time. So, I mean, we have to have some kind of an education program for the general public. Like, what's a news story? Yeah, what should it have? What's an opinion piece? I mean, the fact that they think an editorial is the same thing as an opinion piece, it's just, I can't believe it. And they don't know what a feature is either. They don't know anything. So, Sorry. Well, and just to jump in briefly, and I promise I'll hand you the mic. Um, I mean, that's what the that's what the trust indicators do right on the page. So, and I agree with you. I think we need we need more education behind it. Um, but the idea is meet people where they are, and they're getting their news not necessarily from the brand anymore, but through social media and search. So, can we provide those indicators right there on the page as they open it up? Go ahead. Just a moment on this, which is that, and to echo what you're saying, which is that the, like I said, the information and the communication is ripped from the sources. So, so on the one that people might not be able to tell the difference, but that's also because the cues that we have in the offline world aren't in, aren't there in the online world to distinguish between these different types of, uh, uh, you know, journalistic or information sources. Um, and what, I think there, for, there's a lot of research that needs to be done about whether how we provide these cues in the online world and whether it makes a difference. So, so the experiment. The, Fake news flags that Facebook went through in this last year was a perfectly reasonable approach, I thought, to, to that problem. They've now pulled that because it didn't have the effect that they thought it would. Um, and so trying to figure out whether giving people more information actually has an effect and on who, who is going to uh, sort of be affected by that treatment is very important. Now, on, on the regulation point, like the fairness doctrine and like. So, so much of, of the 
exceptions to general First Amendment law that we had applied um, to broadcast, like the Fairness Doctrine, were predicated on two ideas. The first was limited spectrum space and captive audiences, right? And we don't have really either of those in the, in, in the internet. And so, because uh, the spectrum is essentially, you know, potentially infinite, although with net neutrality, there's some interesting sort of ideas one might er, uh, uh, think about there. Uh, and then the audiences are captured to some extent in that their, their attention seems to be gravitating toward a few sites, but not in the way that it was sort of thought about. And so that the, the forcing news organizations to engage in a right of apply, which the, the constitutional the constitutionality of that even today, under today's First Amendment law is really suspect. It's probably not even um, uh, hanging by, by that slender reed. Uh, but uh, it's hard to think, how would we define the universe of websites that have to grant a right of reply, right? And so um, more likely, I think, are these outside tools. And you can see the, like the red feed, blue feed, if you know that, that um, website, where you, you essentially adopt Chrome extensions or other kinds of uh, uh, additions to our social media feeds that expose you to different points of view, right? And Facebook is, has tried to do some of this also as, the, uh, well, if you're reading this, you might want, you know, look at this uh, countervailing uh, information source. Uh, whether this makes any difference or not, I have no idea, you know, because ultimately it's about where the eyeballs are going to track uh, and whether the exposure to these alternative points of view in that format really is going to make a difference or not. Um. And I have two quick points. So on the gatekeeper issue, to a certain extent, business models have always been a form of gatekeeping. Media is really interesting, right? Because in terms of um, your margins get bigger with scale. And, you know, historically with like television and, and you know, the, mon the monopolies sort of that, have, that emerge with um, print publications, that has sort of shifted. And what's been really interesting uh, to see is sort of the shaming of a lot of the brands in terms of advertising through sort of automated networks and how they've been moving. So I think there is a flight to quality. I'm speaking for myself, I'm actually fairly optimistic that at least financially motivated fake news is going to be something that can be dealt with within the next five to seven years. I mean, it's a chronic problem, sort of like spam, but is it's sort of, it will be manageable. What is actually much more concerning is non-financially motivated fake news, whether or not you have state-based state, state -based actors. Yeah. So the other, the other kind of idea behind um, business models, uh, sorry, about gatekeeping is there's a certain amount of like soft gatekeeping that we see you know, in different social contexts. So for example, in New York City, if you have uh, restaurants with I think more than 12 or six stores, you have now have to show uh, the caloric take, you know, sort of the caloric counts. And so, you know, at a certain point, if you are a person, you look at the cafe mocha, you know, whatever, pipe, pumpkin spice latte at 560 calories, you're like, ooh, like, so if you give um, people a certain amount of information, they can change their behavior accordingly. And so that is another sort of form of gatekeeping. Thank you, Jennifer. And just uh, quickly, about six minutes ago, I was given a five minute time. Uh, and so I, I'm going to come to John next and just exercise a bit. We started a bit late. We do have a very hard kind of begin again at one and there will have to be a transition and lunch. So we're going to try to be efficient and I'll go ahead and apologize. I've got, I'm sure we've got hours of question and answers for you all. And so as I think about your questions, um, I am going to go to John um, and Lewis put hers down and then Charlie and then perhaps We'll try to be efficient, but I really appreciate y'all's patience with us. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jamie. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be quick. So, so I was curious about um, in your um, in the trust indicators number six, uh, the notion of locally sourced. In in our work here, we rather reflexively quickly get to national stuff. Um, and and it, I, I guess it's because we're not concerned about the Russians stealing city council elections or influencing sanitation departments, although come to think of it, it's probably not a bad idea. Um, I'm, I'm curious what was behind this as you interviewed people. Was it, what did the interviewees feel was missing? Was it that, that national news sources didn't understand local perspective? Was it the disappearance of local news Infrastructure was a little bit of both. I'm just, if you could just get a little bit below that, I'd be curious what, what you heard from people. Great, thank you. Yeah, and it did come out strongly from members of the public, and we also heard it from news organizations. So what people were talking about is we want to know about news that is relevant to us 
geographically and relevant to us demographically as well. And a sense that, um, like Wendy, I'll use Wendy as an example. She's one of the people that I showed up there. She's an opportunistic news user. She wants news to help her understand what's going on in her community and in the world. And um, because she wants to, to make her community a better place to live. So national news doesn't quite offer that. And, and I do feel we really we need to pay attention to local news. For one thing, local news is sometimes the most trusted source of information because they're the closest to the people um, involved. Sometimes they, they are the public producing the news. And also local news, what we forget about, is such an important engine for national inter and international news. So that's the other reason in there. it's in there is because national and international organizations need to give credit to and point to the local organizations that this is coming from. And it's a signal of credibility because if, if something happens in Tampa and the Tampa reporters are covering it or Ferguson, those folks are familiar with the community, they're familiar with the site, and they're most likely to be able to produce highly accurate news about whatever that incident is. News organizations know that, they can pull that out and, and into the national context, and then the public understands that too. Okay. Carly? First of all, Nate, I want to apologize for the computer thing because you also, it's a metaphor for the problem. <laughs> it, 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 it is, it's a wonderful experience. Now, you <laughs> said something right at the beginning of your comment, and this is the second time this commission has heard this because Charlie uh, Firestone said it at our last meeting, that really what's at stake here is that the entire notion of the marketplace of ideas might be flawed. Everything that we talk about is this assumption that if we get true information, you know, um, accurate facts versus false facts, that the truth will win out. And that's really being challenged. And I guess I almost feel like we're dancing around this because if you don't have an educated, literate public that cares about truth, then everything we're talking about here is pretty much Band-Aids. And we've spent a lot of time beating up on, um, you know, the Internet. We've, uh, you know, commented on journalism. Um, but we've only touched on the responsibility of our, of our educational system to teach literacy, civic literacy. Uh, we didn't talk about the content of that. Part of the problem that I've experienced is just watching how dumbed down our electorate has become. We don't teach the Constitution necessarily. Um, you, you raise the term of the rule of law. People like, look at you like you know, in blank. So I guess I would, I'd like to throw out, you know, what is the responsibility of, of our educational system? Um, we have a memo that suggests the possibility of, of a, am I allowed to mention this stuff? I mean, no, of, of, a, <laughs> of, a, of, a, of a major effort, like a moonshot, to educate you know, the American people into these values. You know, fundamental literacy, which we, we do a lousy job with, civics literacy, which we do a lousy job with, you know, health literacy, a variety of other things. So, you know, we, you know in, the, in the few minutes that we have, could we just talk about, does anybody here think that, that our educational system is doing an adequate job in, in, in preparing citizens to be in a democracy? Nate, you wanna... Can I just say yeah, thank yeah. you for what you just said? Because I have a new website called moonshots.org. Okay. <laughs> I, I and <laughs> I want you to know that's exactly what I'm trying to talk about, exactly. And um, no, we're doing a terrible job. The whole system is failing. We're all teaching to the test. They're really great test takers, fantastic, but they can't do anything else. So uh, let me just point you to, to the work of Sam Weinberg here at Stanford who's doing some, some of that was referenced, but let me, let me um, caution about how much I think we can do because I think that, first of all, all of this is worth investing in in and of itself, right? Um, the challenge is we have become so polarized as a society so that, um, and people I think are taking their cues from such different information sources uh, and that it is becoming extremely difficult to build the kind of neutral metrics that you're sort of talking about um, in the face of this incredible polarization that we're seeing in the information ecosystem, right? And so the question is, can you use government or you know, public education to essentially counteract the uh, you know, alternative facts ideology which is now pervading um, uh, national discourse? Because as, as was said earlier, right, it's not just the internet, right? It, it's what's happening writ large in our political system. I mean, if we had a group of, of conservative foundations sitting here and we said, hey, how about a major initiative to teach the Constitution to teach the Bill of Rights, 
to talk about you know, the, the checks and balances and the rule of law. I'm guessing that people across the aisle would go, hey, this would be a good moment for this. I mean, you know, should, should you be able to graduate high school with, without knowing these things? Well, yes, yeah. you know, Sandra Day O'Connor has had this, this right. initiative since she left the court. Um, and so there is, is there, I can't remember if it was University of Arizona or Arizona State, but, but that she has this whole sort of set of uh, materials for this. So does the National Constitution Center. Uh, and so, you know, obviously it's, it's critical to do all of these things. Um, and it exists. Yeah. Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And so, uh, Meredith, I'm going to give you the last hit, and then we're going to break after that, if that works, for one Perfect. last question. Thank you. Um, thank you all for this. This is phenomenal. One note for the commission is these efforts that we're hearing about from, from Sally and Jenny and Esther, um, I believe they're among a constellation of similar efforts, and it might be really good for us to have an understanding of what's being done on and around this front, right? And, 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 and really help uh, connect that and understand that because each one of them is powerful alone, but I think they're also um, powerful together. Um, Esther, I was trying to square um, the, the digital literacy that you're talking about with what we talked about on the previous panel about this battle for attention. So I'm curious from an educator's point of view do those things, are, are, you, are you teaching and should the students be taught while we are teaching you how to use these platforms, you also need to make sure that you can exist independent of these things and be aware that you are getting uh, sucked down the rabbit hole uh, from, from various attempts of some well-meaning people, maybe some not, who knows, but um, are you teaching them to not be addicts as well? Yes, I actually don't ban the phone. I teach them how to self-control. When to use the phone, how to use the phone. I mean, with a class of ratio one to 60, the question is who's gonna win, right? We already know. So um, if you don't see the kids using their phone in my class, because I, they have, they know exactly what they should be doing, and I trust them again. It's amazing the power of trust. You trust them to behave a certain way, and they want to rise to those expectations. And in the schools, that's just the opposite. They act like policemen. And I'm telling you, the kids are winning. And so they have these things called phone hotels. Have you heard about those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to put your phone in a hotel when you come into school in the morning, and you pick it up at 3.30 when you leave. How's that teaching them any self-control? I believe they do that at the White House. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, well, the White House, he needs it. <laughs> well, I, I would say that I think that's what Esther is doing in the classroom really is a, a broader, there's a broader lesson there. Um, I mean, the students are in charge, and the students are are making change, and they're they're developing strategies about information and about use of their time in terms of um, addiction or not. And so, I, I believe that we are we are underestimating the capacity of the public here to um, provide some their own guidance on what is trustworthy information and to guide one another, and also underestimating the thirst for accurate information and the effort that some people are going to in order to to find that. And that's what I would really like to see us collectively tap into. Matt, um, thank you all very much. Our panelists, Charlie, I would love any advice on our next transition, where we're to be, um, or Christine. Christine's pointing that way. Uh, and again, want to thank uh, the thoughtful questions. I'm sure we'll have more, but and uh, appreciate the learning agenda you've already offered to us. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank, thank you. you.